Fire Podcast, episode 76. We are here. Sorry we missed an episode last week. We did not want to have to do that. We tried our best to not have to do that, but it ended up happening anyway because we were living at my dad's house yes. for a little over a week. What? Nine, ten days? Ten days. Ten days we were at without a house. <laughs> yeah. So that was insane. We were living in his tiny house in the backyard, which actually tiny houses are pretty lit. Just saying. Yeah. I yeah. Kind of just kind of day. a hard place to podcast. Really, yeah. So. Yeah. No, not a good space to podcast, but um, we're here now. Now we're in the house and we have the old setup back. We yeah. decided to just kind of rig a setup for now because we are planning on building a studio on our land, but that's obviously going to take a little bit of time. We have to go through permits and building and mm -hmm. contractors and everything. So for the next, you know, month to two months, you guys are going to be seeing us in the original format here in front oh, yeah. of our green screen. Yes. <laughs> Handy dandy. Never lets us down. No, it's it, it works fine, you know. Yeah, like whatever I'm, i kind of miss the green screen sometimes yeah it's fun because you can like kind of switch up the background switch yeah, up the vibe exactly maybe we'll put like a cape cod picture up today because today oh, we're going to be talking idea. about cape cod a case out of cape cod which i thought would be interesting to talk about because so many of you probably do go on like trips to cape cod in the summer it's a really popular vacation spot mm -hmm. for a lot of families it's like tradition to go there every summer and i thought this was kind of an interesting summer case it yeah it's of, a really tragic story FYI, it's but really it's, tragic it's interesting. Just there's so many aspects to it, different angles to look at it from. And um, this is one of those suspects. It's and, a real kind of like who done it type. Of, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Like we're going to be looking at a bunch of different suspects. Like and, you really don't know at the mm -hmm. end, like what, what the no, deal is. No, no. What happens not. to poor Krista Worthington? Cause it's just, it's insane, man. Yeah. It it's is. crazy. So we'll get into that. But oh, yeah. first. I also want to thank our sponsors for today. Yes. Third love calm which we'll need some of that today upstart <laughs> and ring for their continued support of the show but enough of that let's get into uh oh man this past week has been crazy there uh, it was hard to honestly just pick three yes. things that t or three or four things to talk about because mm -hmm. in just a week we like a the lot. world goes nuts and all the shit happens yeah. <laughs> and one thing that we really wanted to talk about last week that we or the week before that we forgot to talk about is this area 51 mm -hmm. facebook event storming the gates of area 51 yep. this has gotten so big i mean last time we podcasted this was kind of a thing but not really on the scale it is now um i guess it's kind of ramped down by now but it was getting coverage from cnn and oh yeah it got like, the attention it, of the actual huge. base itself yeah oh yeah like on facebook 1.9 million say they're going <laughs> 1.4 million are interested. In okay, so let's pretend 1.9 million actually were gonna showed show up at up. Area 51. What would happen? What would that be like? I think. Well, a. I think that. How the hell are they going to get into it? For one, <laughs> you know, if even if they all 1.9 million just walked up, they to are it, gonna. What isn't it called? Natoro run or whatever. What is Naruto it called? run? Yeah. Naruto run. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what that is? Yeah. Do not pull it up. <laughs> Move faster than their bullets is what it says. Which this oh, is we don't obviously have a screen to watch things on, but you can just like. <laughs> no, but this is like obviously a joke, right? Like the yeah, guy who made it was it on a the streamer. Screen, though, because they <laughs> yeah, say no, we'll, like in the we'll description that that's the run that you're supposed to have to be able to get in. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a really it's a good good joke. I got I thought it was funny. I'm sure the people hosting it are actually. Well, it's a meme. No, it was a total oh, no. joke. It was it a says, streamer hosted by shit posting because I'm in shambles. <laughs> yeah, it was literally a streamer that started it as like a joke, pretty much. Yeah, okay. and then it just went viral and it became a <laughs> literal meme. Like so all the memes. There come will out be of it. people that go though. Oh yeah, well I think there's gonna be some people that are being serious <laughs> about it, and the Air Force is like. Please be aware that if you show up at Area 51, America will guard our assets. Yeah. And basically, we will shoot you yeah, if dude. you come near us. They have shoot or on site you. orders. They have their own security branch at for private at security. For 20. <laughs> oh my God. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Don't it might, hey, Forever 21, it might as guys. well be a Forever 21, though, honestly. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know what <laughs> my brain just did. It's all right. The 21. Area 51 has its own security <laughs> group that guards Area 51. Yeah, it's, not, it's a and private security Yeah, it's private. Force. It's not U.S. military. It's not police. It's just like these random dudes in trucks and stuff. Mm -hmm. Camo and, dudes. Yeah, the camo dudes is what they call them. Yeah. And they will fucking kill you. 
So I mean, don't go to Area 51, guys. If anyone out there is listening to this and you're planning to go to Area 51, well, you can go to Area 51. This you can go to the like visitor center. Yeah, go to the visitor center, but don't try to (laughs) Natoro whatever the fuck run in there and get your ass into the aliens. They will, yeah, they will. Because first of all, like if you haven't seen Josh and I have done a podcast on Area 51. If you are curious about Area 51, I definitely recommend checking that out. We also did a video as well that was good um, on my channel, but. I mean, if you don't know, chances are there's probably nothing at Area 51 anymore. Anything really juicy right, as far as yeah. aliens go. No, no. Because they know that like people know about it now. But for a long time, Area 51 was not acknowledged by the government until what, 2004? They acknowledged yeah, it or I something? I forget the exact date, but it, it was... It was not that long ago. That long up ago. until that long, up until that date, they, you know, said that it wasn't real. So I think once they acknowledged it, they probably moved a lot of things. Well, they like declassified it pretty much like the name and stuff yeah. and confirmed its existence because, you know, before that, like Bob Lazar, he was the one who mm-hmm. really brought it to the mm-hmm. public's attention in the sixties. And that's why it got right. so popular is yeah. because, you know, he worked on flying yeah. saucers there. And whatever. I mean, do you think they At still have point? the things that Bob Lazar worked on there anymore? No, I don't think so. No, Cause I think it they, would be a major security risk with the amount of people that totally, know about that. Totally. They would not oh, yeah. keep it there. And there's so many bases. We've looked at underwater bases, you guys all I mean all over the world. There's underground bases and, and, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. secret stuff. I mean, there's plenty of other places for them to keep stuff. So, <laughs> Oh yeah. I think the people going into area 51 are going to be mistaken. Yeah. And I mean, it's an air force base yeah. after all. So, it's mostly used for testing and they probably have some like secret weapon type aircraft, mm-hmm. things like that. I'm sure they have. stuff. Oh, like I'm that sure there. it's still like high, highly protected. There's some stuff in there for sure. You know, I think are the, they storing alien bodies and spacecraft? Yeah. Though? Yeah. I don't know. No, I think that ship sailed a long time yeah, ago. I think that would be pretty stupid of them to keep it there. Considering everyone knows that that's what it was for. Yeah. No, that would be so dumb. So what do people think? They're just going to storm in and there's going to be like little aliens behind bars. Like <laughs> yeah. let us out, let us free. And they're going to just right? like, like bust everybody out. The whole place out. is probably so coded and protected. Like Dude. good luck trying to break your ass no. through all the different levels and get yeah. to anything good. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> You're going to get to like the chow house. Good luck even the... getting anywhere close to it. Like those people, they're out. Like it's not like they're only watching the building. They are monitoring miles of area oh, yeah. around the base. You won't even get close base. to the building. Yeah, no way. <laughs> You'll be shot long before that. Yeah, yeah. So good luck, fellas. Um, what day is that? September twentieth. Twentieth. Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> stop! 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 The dogs no, no. are still. You know, we're in the new house, so they're still like no, barking no. at every single sound. I just oh, kicked there's the a desk. Motorcycle. Oh, that's what they hear. A motorcycle. They heard it last night. There's somebody in here that rides a yeah. motorcycle that's like going yeah, crazy. Yeah, someone was riding it like crazy last night. It almost scared me. Bernie's like, let me at him. All right, well, moving on. Yeah. So the don't next- go to Area 51 is the moral of that story because you're not going to live. <laughs> Basically. So the next thing is actually really scary ish. Well, let me know what you think about this. So a whistleblower who was working for Apple has revealed recently to The Guardian actually that. It's popular voice activated virtual assistant Siri now in millions of households, which I'm sure that number is much harder or much harder, much larger, regularly records people having sex and captures other countless invasive moments, which it promptly sends to Apple contractors for their quality control. Hmm. That's what they say. They're like, we have to gather all this information. It just so happens to be all the juicy stuff. And then send it to our what contractors. What do they have to hear in people's so they, sex life to improve the audio? Yeah. That's really freaky because like, think about it. I was thinking about it earlier. You probably have your phone somewhere near you when you have sex. I and mean, if you are partaking in such things. And I mean, it's always near me. No matter what I'm doing, my phone's like in the room. So it's always there. No, it, it <laughs> it's is. Listening, it's listening, I guess. Always, yeah, it is always listening. So that's like really freaky to me. I think that's so, like, it's stuff like this that's like black mirror shit, you know? Like, we really don't have it's a very that, invasive. That's so invasive and scary to think that people, like, what if there was like blackmail? What if they could use it to like blackmail you or something? No, that, that's or, the, like, that's a fear of it is. Not that anyone would want to hear what's going on. <laughs> Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of people that have a lot of juicy stuff going on in their lives. Like people that have affairs or like private things they don't want people to know about, like secret things that they're doing or, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, that's insane to me. So a specific example, um, of this 
Um, one of the insiders said that there have been countless instances of recordings featuring private discussions between doctors and patients, which is fucked. That makes sense too. Business Cause you deals, always have your phone in there. Right. Business deals, always. seemingly criminal dealings, uh, sexual encounters and so on. It also shows, um, your you're user, never alone. not only does it capture recording, it's also showing your user data, including location, contact details, and app data. So That's all scary. this information about where you are ge geographically, as well as what you're doing and talking about is being sent to third party. We don't even know who they are. I don't even know what company it is. This is an anonymous guy that came forward to leak this stuff, but it's like, what the fuck are they really doing? You know, what are they doing with all that data? Know, are they really, really just, me. are they really using that to, you know, improve Seems Siri's like there's dictation. gotta be better ways, but how are they going to turn it off? Cause how can you teach Siri to not record everything. sex stuff, yeah. but everything else right? or like when to know what, a, what is private and what's not like, it's still AI. It's not going to know the difference. No, I know. But my whole thing is it's, isn't it, don't you find it kind of odd that this leaker specifically pointed to these things and was like, they're looking like we have recordings of specific fucking things. It's almost like, could they be filtering to get only those things? Like they, Maybe. they pull all your data all the time, but then they have filters that they run it through that dumps it all of the recordings into these baskets that are the following baskets that he mentioned for whatever reason. I mean, why would they, again, why would yeah, why the government would or the, this company want to know, you know, what I sound like in the bedroom, you know, or like, <laughs> you know, what, what do they get out of that? You yeah. Know? Unless they're capturing Here's a, here's a theory. <laughs> I've got my, my tin hat on right now. So here's a theory. They are capturing this data to then feed to their AI, all this data from us so that when they roll out AI in all the forms, including like a human form, they're going to be ready to go. They've got all of the recordings already programmed into them. So they sound For like and, sex robots. And yeah. And, they, and just, they are, they're able to dictate and know all aspects of a human both good and bad how about that that's could they shit. be doing that i don't know that's really freaky i mean why else are they doing this come on it's not just to fucking improve her dictation she sucks as it is <laughs> yeah <she really> does. <laughs> it's clearly not working if you're yeah what trying I mean, to improve your dictation I know. so she's just but how are they supposed to like pick it all up and like when know when to stop and when to so it's really just of whether or not they They're should be able to record it. or not. It's always recording. That's the thing is it yeah, feels like. Can't, yeah, that's crazy. Or it's that smart that it can just capture those moments because that's what it wants. Mm -hmm. That's so weird and so creepy, but. It really is. Yeah, that's what you got to look forward to with Apple, guys. <sighs> so but at I the end of the day, it's like, do I really care? Like, do I have anything <laughs> to hide? Really do I really give a shit? Like, I have nothing to hide. I'm not doing any criminal dealings mm -mm. yet, but. You know, yet <laughs> I'm just saying like you, could, you know, that that whole bit, like, could it get to a point where we're being monitored and, you know, this instant you say you're going to do something bad, you're like reprimanded. Mm -hmm. That'd be crazy. That might be where we're headed. That's scary. In the worst case scenario. <laughs> but let's let's move on to some lighter news. Yeah, this is really interesting. So there's a study that have has found that cannabis can relieve pain. 30 times better than aspirin, which is so interesting to me because I have never gotten any pain relief from aspirin, ever, aspirin, aspirin right. ever. Right. Like whenever I take Advil or aspirin, I'm always telling you like it doesn't do shit for me. And you're always like, babe, take an Advil. It'll well, that's help. what you're always, I mean, that's I know, but the, it doesn't do anything for, for me. It. Like, but marijuana does. Yeah. Well, now it we know why it's 30 times. It's the cannabis plant itself. It has these molecules mm -hmm. called canflavin A and B. And they're the actual molecules that are providing that 30, 30 times, you know, efficiency when it yeah. comes to pain relief. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, it just goes to show you that and the more research we do on the cannabis plant, I'm telling you, there's going to be a million other things that it's going to help with. And we're going to be able to prove scientifically that this is legitimate medicine. Like cannabis yes. is a legitimate yes. medical plant and a medical remedy mm -hmm. that's natural. And doesn't have any bad side effects to They're it. They're only learning more. And the more and more research that goes into it, the more we're going to learn how to utilize it and how to cure in, insane diseases, incurable yeah. diseases that they say. Cancer even, maybe. Yes. I mean, you probably know. Yes. There um, could be something. There's been cases of, you know, 
people with tumors that doctors say this is terminal. You're like, this cannot be removed. And then cannabis oil, massive amounts of it treats it and shrinks it. Totally. Completely. And seizures. I mean, the, what I've seen a little bit of cannabis oil do for people's yes. seizures is unbelievable. unbelievable. It's, it's truly remarkable. It's a medicine. It really is. And it's like a natural gift to the earth. And I'm so tired of judgment about it. You know, yeah, I've just gotten seriously. over it. When we first started this podcast, I was so weird about it. I didn't even want to tell yeah, anyone that yeah. I used weed because. Which is understandable. Yeah. I mean, half the people that know about it, like don't, I mean, people are still so judgmental about yeah. it. Like there's some people that think it's like the equivalent of heroin or something. So that's what makes me nervous to say it. But that's but, just people that are ignorant and yeah. uneducated about and it. And honestly, I'm happy to be an advocate for it. I think in 20 years from now, it'll be so normalized that like, it won't be weird at all that people I mean, do it. will be on. like completely like, first normal. Of all, I, I feel like that is decreasing by the minute that those Definitely. people, that, because what's great is I have seen CBD really just start to flourish across Totally. The world really mm -hmm. like it's becoming readily available like everywhere. Mm -hmm. You can go to any Check gas station around here and get uh, CBD capsules. Yeah. Or like just go to hempbombs.com. Or go to hempbombs.com. Use code Mahar. But, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it really is good stuff. And, you know, I'm happy to advocate for it, too, because mm -hmm. it's natural. There's nobody dying from it. There's and I feel nobody like getting there's a lot of judgment it. as a woman in general to as smoking more so than men, because especially women with children that there's like a lot of judgment of mothers that use it. Sure. And well, I think there's yeah. a lot of stereotypes that people think that if you smoke, that you are like a lazy stoner or something. And there's all these just incorrect stereotypes about the type mm -hmm. of people that smoke. And most of the people that you'd find out that do, you're like, Oh wow. I would have no idea. Like some of the people that I know that do, you would never know. Oh no. And, and, and that's the thing too, is anybody that, is on that other side. I would just love to be like, just come to a dispensary with me on a busy Saturday afternoon. <laughs> it's like the, going to the Apple store. <laughs> it's literally like going, it's better than going to your liquor store because everybody there is happy, yeah. wants to be there, is in no a good spirit. No one's spirits. addicted. There's no. not like, no, yeah, there's addicts nobody like in there around. like yeah. dealing with stuff. It's very normal. It's mm -hmm. it's like going to the grocery store, to be honest with you. Like, yeah, there's the same people clientele of all ages, there. Yeah. like older women, older men. I mean, just not, it's not always what people think. Yeah, I mean, it was people just have a very yesterday. warped version from like movies, like yeah. uh, super troopers and stuff of like what a stoner is. Yeah, totally. You know, like yesterday it was just there or pick, pineapple picking Express up there or, and, and it was super busy and I love it when it's super busy because I love to just see who shows up and it was the most widespread, like right before me, uh, there was like a little couple that were like in their sixties. And they're like, we're not really sure. This is our first time. I think they're from out of state. And they're like, this is our first time being here, but we just want to try some of those gummies. <laughs> Hell you know, yeah. And they just bought some gummies. And that's what's awesome, too, is I think there's so much stigma and, and around smokers, you know, versus there's yeah. all of types of ways to consume it. You can vape it. You can mm -hmm. you dab it. You can you can literally, you know, eat it, drink it now. Like mm -hmm. there's Keith. there's so many ways to consume THC. Keith Cola, baby. Look it up. Yeah. Delicious. Yeah. Delicious cola. <laughs> refreshing. <laughs> on the tongue but yeah you know it's i think the the stigma is melting and i think we're gonna I see it too. legalized in america that's why i'm over it like i don't soon. care anymore i'm just like whatever no, i don't give a shit <clears throat> i don't give a shit it's the most real thing that i know mm -hmm. yes it's the most surefire I really thing that i put all my faith and i put mm -hmm. all my money into that plant yeah. because i believe in that plant 100 percent. and i think you've it's seen just the effects for me like for sure if everybody in the world used some form of cannabis especially one that was psychoactive. I think we would see a much better world. Just people would be way more understanding open and, and open-minded about mm -hmm. life and just everything mm -hmm. and understanding. And I'm sure any of you out there who have like any type of pain or something like that, that if you do use it, you probably agree that it helps so much. Like it's just, it blows everything else out of the water where it's just like everything else becomes useless. Like mm -hmm. Advil, I could give a fuck. Yeah, it works better. Like CBD yeah. works better for a lot of people for sleep and things like that. It's the best, Definitely. best medicine, man. But we could go on all day about that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, though, is literally a giant asteroid went right by the Earth and we barely noticed in time. Like we had no idea that was happening. Like we had a few days heads up and there's a giant asteroid that nearly struck the planet. Oh, my God. It was 328 feet wide. It was only 70,000 kilometers from Earth. And they saw it like in Australia, like race over. Wow. That's scary. Yeah. Could it have like just what yeah, would have happened if it hit us? It would wipe out a large area of that 
Yeah. Wherever that impact is. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's wild. That's crazy. That's, we're like at, in a constant threat of being just pummeled by an, an asteroid, a giant space rock at any time. <laughs> That's what's crazy too, is like we can have all the anxiety like here on the planet about our lives and the world mm-hmm. and the government and everything else. But it's like, you know, at the end of the day, like mm-hmm. the universe is in control. And if mm-hmm. it wants to fire a giant asteroid at us, like it's going to, it's going to, and there's yeah. not a damn thing we can do about it. And that's just the way it is. But like, it also could not happen. Well, yeah, so you can't live your just, life in fear. Right, and it like could that. just go on being fine and missing us mm-hmm. just so slightly, you know? So, mm-hmm. you know, count your blessings. <laughs> That's my world of story right there. All right. Well, with that, we wanted to get into our sponsors for today. So if you're anything like me, you've had a bad experience when it comes to bras. I've always hated bras. And a few years ago, I got a breast reduction and it was really confusing to figure out even what bras to get after that because my size changed and everything. And that is when I found Third Love, which is our sponsor for today. So I've been a customer of Third Love for a while. I truly love these bras and they are the only bras I will wear. Seriously. The coolest thing about it is they have a quiz on their website called The Fit Finder, where you go through kind of like a series of questions and they go off a bunch of different data and they find your perfect fit. And I actually found out that I was wearing the wrong bra size for like a few years since my reduction. And I recently retook the quiz and was corrected. And I've been a lot happier in my bras since. They have more sizes than other brands. In fact, they offer 70 different sizes, including their signature half cup sizes. It's very convenient because you don't have to go to the store. You just hop right onto their website. Every customer has 60 days to wear it, wash it, put it to the test. And if you don't love it, you can return it and Third Love will wash it and actually donate it to a woman in need. Returns and exchanges are free and easy, which is awesome. Gotta love an online brand like that. And it is hands down going to be the most comfortable bra you own. And I'm serious about that. They are not only comfortable, but they're also really pretty. Like you don't have to sacrifice the style to also get the comfort with Third Love, which is why I truly love it. Third Love knows that there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now they are offering our listeners 15% off their first order. Just go to thirdlove.com slash mile higher now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash mile higher for 15% off today. So if you follow me on any of my social media, you know that I love to take a bath pretty much every night before bed. And one of my favorite things to do when I take this bath is use a calm meditation, one that is focused on sleep, because I know as soon as I get out, I'm going to get in my nice warm bed and drift off to dreamland. What I have realized since I've started having a bunch of health issues related to my autoimmune disease and whatever else is going on, sleep is one of the most vital things that you can give your body. I notice a huge difference if I don't get at least eight hours-ish of sleep. It can affect your cognitive functions during the day, how you're feeling overall. Sleep is one of the most vital things in your life. And that's why we have partnered with my all-time favorite app, Calm. This is the number one app for sleep. I use Calm not only for sleep, but for meditation in general. Whenever I need a moment of peace or I need to just center my brain, it's very hard to meditate. And Calm has a bunch of guided meditations that can help you learn how to actually do the practice of meditation because it's very hard to completely clear your brain. But they don't only offer meditation. They also offer a variety of tools to help you sleep. They have soundscapes and over a 100 different sleep stories narrated by different soothing voices. So you can find one that you like. So if you want to seize your day, make sure you get your Z's at night with the Calm app. Right now, Mile Higher listeners can get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash mile higher. That's C-A-L-M dot com slash mile higher. 40 million people have already downloaded the Calm app. Find out why at calm.com slash mile higher. So the case of Krista Worthington, this is a story that takes place in Massachusetts, actually. Mm -hmm. And Krista Worthington, she was born on December 23rd, 1956, and was like a local native to Mm -hmm. uh, the Massachusetts area, lived in a suburb south of Boston, um, which shout out to Boston. Never been there, but... I think it's pronounced Hingham. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is too. But she grew up like in a really like prominent family, had a very privileged upbringing. Her Mm -hmm. father was super successful. He was a lawyer. Yeah. Educated Harvard, from Harvard, educated. Yeah. they had money. Like she had a you know decent childhood in that regard. So very, yeah, um, definitely good upbringing. Supported, supported and, parents, yeah. educated, smart, really, and, really smart. Actually, mm-hmm. yeah. Very in fact, into she school. 
Yeah, she was very into school. She graduated high school and went to Vassar College, which is a very like selective private school in New York. And she just did really well in her classes. She excelled. And after graduating college, she spent several decades working in high fashion as a mm-hmm. fashion writer. Mm-hmm. So super into that world, which mm-hmm. I know a little bit about that world. <laughs> you don't know anything about <laughs> hey, that. I've world, watched the me. Devil Wears Prada. Okay, so that's that was literally what they compa- all you that's know. What they compare that to the yeah, they did compare her to working that. in an office like that. Hey, I'm yeah, watching. that her life was a lot like that. It was a lot of high parties strong, and high much, yeah. events, and you know, fabulous people and fancy clothes, and mm-hmm. you know, surrounded by a lot of probably pretty shallow people i'm guessing i mean th- could be yeah, for sure i mean yeah this this world is very very cutthroat it's a lot about looks yeah, definitely you're judged a lot on definitely. your looks because and what it's fashion you are wearing mm-hmm. how expensive your clothes are and you know she felt a lot of pressure just like anne hathaway in devil yeah. wears prada to like fit into this world yeah, and it just takes a whole really lot of your it. time too. Like it sucks it up. But she was like super into it. She like really thrived as this high fashion writer. Yeah, she actually Gucci wrote for Prada. like uh, the major magazines: Cosmo, New York Times, Elle magazine. Mm-hmm. She interviewed. She also interviewed like celebrities like Martha Stewart. Yep. Um, as well as some other fashion designers. And at one point, she dated Anderson Cooper's brother. Actually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But she was also somebody that had a bit of an obsessive personality. She was very obsessed with, you know, money, sex, all those kinds of things. Like, that's at least what people say. I don't know for sure. I'm I'm on the fence with that because I'm like, well, how do you really know? Yeah. How much evidence is there for that? Because that seems like kind of a little strong, you know, like strong language. Like, it's not like she was like a prostitute or something like that. I mean, they said she had an obsessive personality that she got obsessive about certain things and that she even had issues like being obsessed with things like regret. But specifically, she like she, it seemed like she had an extreme really passionate personality. about like yeah. everything that yeah. she really liked. So she's a Sagittarius, too. And so like that kind of explains that like she she was really passionate about a lot of different things and she could kind of obsess over them and Mm -hmm. sex was one of them right right um so she which i mean is a lot of women are like that like they just she never really like settled down she um i think kind of feared commitment she was she really kids right like she didn't want to have kids for at first right um and she you know she just was having a lot of fun and really wasn't she was very independent was she a capricorn what is it the 23rd yeah, I was going to say, make sure you got that right. <laughs> I thought she was a Sagittarius if so she's on the 23rd, but. It was, uh, go back here, December 23rd. No, oh, 1956. Mm-hmm. So either way, I mean, she's right on the cusp, so. So Krista had basically an obsessive personality. Is what uh, they from say. From a lot of accounts. People said that she was very obsessed and passionate about the things that she did. And then when she, you know. When it came was, to work. Right, work. School, getting money, things like money, that. Money, all these things, and then sex as well. Right. Mm-hmm. That this was something that she just really liked to do, had a lot of partners, things like that. Like she mm-hmm. was very into it and just, yeah, something that she did a lot. Yeah. She didn't seem like the type that like really settled down. She liked to be kind of free to do whatever she wanted. She was a very independent type of woman. So, and a very pretty woman too at that. Like she was definitely. Yeah. And I mean, she was in this and, like high fashion world. Mm-hmm. Like she was, yeah, really pretty and um, dressed really nice and was definitely a catch. But she was also really smart too, which was, uh, you know, interesting about her. She was really, really smart, a good writer. I mean, she made even fashion stuff sound like artistic. Yeah. She wrote like a really amazing stuff um, from the people that understand that world. They yeah. said that it was like, yeah. She's like she was writing like the really, Bible yeah. of fashion and stuff. Like it was just she really, was really, really good. good. Mm-hmm. So. And then she, another thing that she experienced a lot in her life was a lot of regret. Yes. Um, that she had this kind of obsession with regret and regretted so many different things. And one of the things that she was regretting as she got older, like closer to her forties, she started regretting the fact that she still hadn't had a child and she wasn't married or like on track to become married Didn't have like anyone she wanted to marry. Like it wasn't looking like, her timeline was going to work with having a child. You know, you can only have a baby for so long. Right. Totally. And that's something that a lot of women have to deal with. Like even, I think every woman has to kind of like think about, you know, this, it's a stressful thing. Your fertility, you don't know like how long you'll be fertile or, um, and 
playing that like time game is yeah. hard because like you want to like take well, as much time know, for yourself for sure. as you can, but then you don't want to also run out of time. So she kind of ended up in that point where she like really made her life all about her and her job and like, but then kind of forgot about this whole other part that she realized she really wanted a child and mm -hmm. wanted to raise someone that's important to her. And she decided that she was going to do this on her own, right. which was really crazy at the time, apparently yeah, in the nineties, like no one apparently was doing Find a this. sperm donor basically. Yeah. And yeah. just raise a child on your, her own, right. which was very, I thought was really cool and unique that she wanted to do that back then. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't just shows how like many independent women she doing is too. That. Like mm -hmm. the fact she was so confident in doing that and yeah. she just did it. Yep. Because like, she I don't knew need a she man. didn't handle it. Like she just, didn't want to just like go settle for someone to like fill that void. Yeah. She'd rather just do it by herself. I thought that was kind of cool. So her plan was kind of to just start <laughs> dating a bunch of different different random guys and secretly trying to conceive, which is honestly really fucked up. <laughs> you probably should oh, yeah. not do that. Surprise, man. You're yeah. Dead. Um, yeah. So she was, she was really upset about, uh, the whole not being able to have a child thing. Like as she was doing it, it was harder than she thought to conceive, which I mean, at this point she was like close to 40. Um, so it was going to be difficult and but she still had faith that it was going to happen she had a feeling that she was going to have a child so she kind of didn't she didn't give up completely yet um and she was really public about this she actually went on the on tv to talk about this um she went on what was it like a uh, oprah or some i don't remember the tv show but it was a yeah it was an just like a talk TV show, show type yeah. thing i don't yeah. think it was oprah actually no. but she went on to talk about like how unusual it was for a woman at that time to try to conceive on their own, which I thought was interesting that she wasn't like using a sperm donor and stuff. She was just trying to like, see yeah, if just she could go get, get lucky pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Convince every guy to like, yeah. But as she kept trying, it got harder and harder. She realized, you know, something's wrong. And that's when she was diagnosed with early menopause, which mean, meant she was probably not going to be able to ever have a child. Right, your chances go down a lot. Major almost zero I yeah think it's like a, almost a zero yeah percent um, chance i mean it's really slim at that point so i mean chris did, uh she's she's like the type of person that you know she's so wants to be so in control of everything in her life she was so like strong and independent that i think not being in control of her body in this situation being able to like work on the timeline that she wanted to was really devastating for her and depressing and finding out that she had menopause was absolutely devastating to her, which I think, I mean, that's like huge to lose that ability because you can't ever, there's such a huge emotional bond that you have. I oh, think, sure. Yeah. By actually having a child right, versus and of like course, just go adopting. Yeah. And adoption adopting is great and is yeah. awesome for so many people, but it's also something that I think a lot of women literally long for. Like it's instinctual. It's literally ingrained sure, totally. in us to want to reproduce and Nurse raise, something. And raise something yes yeah, and totally. leave your leave something when you leave yeah you know um very natural a part of you yeah it's very natural i think that was really depressing for her so i don't even think she was considering adoption she wanted to only have like have a natural birth and go through the whole pregnancy yep. process mm -hmm. and do all of that mm -hmm. so, so this this caused a lot of like turmoil in her life and she kind of wanted to get away from you know the her, hustle bustle the hustle bustle of new, of new york. york city and and move out to cape cod yeah, which Cape Cod's beautiful. I've been out there. When we first met, that's actually where I went when I first met you. So what was that? Almost nine years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I was in New York City, funny enough. Yeah, you were at the at same the time. time. Yeah. Weird. Um, but yeah, I mean, beautiful place. So many people take trips there. I was just watching someone's vlog who was there for a vacation. It looks so nice. Um, but it's pretty mellow area. And this specific area in Cape Cod that she ended up going out to is called Truro. That sounds like Churro, but Truro, Massachusetts. Churro. And it's mm -hmm. a really beautiful area in Cape Cod. It's a really lush area, a lot of greenery. Super rural though, like out yes, there. Yes, definitely. You're out there kind of on your own and it's a small town. Everybody knows everybody and a place where people leave their front doors unlocked for you to just walk in, you know? 
You know, I always like to say they that. They always say that. That's just like, like an old thing. Everybody loves your mom still leaves her door unlocked. Like, oh, I know. Like, she's it's a, just a she thing. She needs to stop though. <laughs> yeah, she's nowadays. in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what she thinks this is. <laughs> the <This> ain't Truro. <laughs> uh, no. Um, but yeah, I mean, they said this is typical. There's no crime here. Nothing ever happens here. And then it did. And it shocked the community. So let's talk about what happens. Yeah. And her, her family was like really well known in, in Truro. And yeah. For, generations they had owned houses out there mm -hmm. so she when she went out there to move from new york city she was going to a cottage at 50 depot road which her family owned mm -hmm. um and it was on the harbor and it used to be her grandmother's um and she thought this would be the perfect place it's this cute little bungalow on the beach yeah um it, it's honestly a cool little spot mm -hmm. great place to just chillax for a bit yeah so she kind of just left the whole you know, high, high class fashion. life behind and went out to Cape Cod to which makes, just makes find peace sense, in her yeah. head, recollect herself. Yeah. Get a change of scenery. For yeah. Sure. I think kind of figure out what was going to happen next. What's her next chapter? Cause now I think she's kind of like letting go of the idea of, okay, I'm probably not going to have a kid. So what's the rest of my life going to look like? Like, what do I want to do? And what do I want? Mm -hmm. And I think that she was kind of at this crossroads and she figured it was kind of a good place to go think about what to do. Yeah, totally. Um, and this is around the time that she met a man named Tony Jacket. Mm -hmm. Tony Jacket wearing his jackets. He didn't actually wear jackets. <laughs> Tony, the the uh, shellfish constable. Shellfish constable. Never even heard of that before. What does that even mean? He's the guy that makes sure all the fishermen are like abiding by the rules and not bringing oh. in too much. And it's kind of like the wildlife guy. It's like fish police. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. But he was a guy that worked locally there and he was married and was a father of six kids. But um, yeah, he got linked up with Krista and uh, they just kind of, you know, met each other. He went over there to help her at her uh, cottage with just some things, you know, mm -hmm. and then I guess one thing led to another and yeah, there was some attraction there and yeah, they ended up hooking up. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so he, she hooked up with Tony mm -hmm. and and it was a wild love affair. They were in bed all day together. She says, yeah, they she were, said they were in bed from 11 a.m. to like 7, 7 p.m. Yeah. What is that? Eight hours. Is that Damn. like constant action or is that like, I don't know. They must have taken a breaks. Few, a few movies in between. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, did you guys have Netflix on or what? Yeah. I mean, I guess this was in the nineties, <laughs> but still, I mean, to have a married man of six kids at, you know, having an affair with yeah. this woman. Yeah. He was a naughty boy. That's not good. Tony. <laughs> yeah. It's very bad. And so his wife has no idea this is going on. Um, so then to Krista's surprise, she finds out that she is pregnant and she thought, you know, that this was impossible. So this was like a miracle to her. I mean, she's stoked, which this it kind of is. is. So, it's yeah, like, wow. totally. Tony's. It seemed like she really was meant to have a kid and she kind of, it's weird that she had a feeling all along I'm going to end up. So I thought that was really crazy, but yeah, this is Tony's kid. And the thing is, is like Tony was pissed because I mean, he did not know. I mean, I think he was under the impression she couldn't have a kid. She right. Probably she like, probably told I him like have menopause and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm sure he was like, Oh shit. Holy. F well, you know, yeah. I mean, he's, having, having another he's kid, got six already. Secret kid. He's like, that's the uh, last thing I need is another one. And he doesn't want his wife to find out. And she's so, thrilled. She's like, hell yeah, yeah, I got a kid now. And yeah, this and is so great. At first she's like, okay, well, no worries. Like, I think she understood. Well, I did kind of like, yeah. you know, I mean, she didn't trick him technically since she didn't think she could actually get pregnant, but she, you know, let, kind of let him off the hook. Yeah. And, and she was like, well, this will be our secret. Yes. Like, you know, don't worry about it. I will it. tell your wife. Like, like, thank you pretty much for giving yeah. me a child. And yeah. I mean, I she was just so involved, grateful. But yep. I get it. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, she was like super cool at first. Mm -hmm. And for a while, you know, she was able to do that. But, you know, how long are you going to be able to How long that? are you going to be able to handle a kid all on your own? And just, well, like, I mean, eventually the kid's going to start asking, asking who's questions. my dad? Yeah. yeah. Where's that? What Where's... are you going to do? So, I mean, I'm sure there was a lot of things that she didn't think about at first that as you parent, you start thinking about and you wish that they were involved. Um, yeah. And she kept a diary too, which is interesting because she, she was such a, a, she was writer. a writer. So she kept a diary. So we have a lot of really intimate details about just her life and what she, mm -hmm. she went through because she wrote everything down. And mm -hmm. she talks about how she was 
really upset that Tony wasn't involved at all in the pregnancy yeah, as time went on. Um, cause she was really struggling, uh, with pregnancy, which I'm sure at that age, like that's gotta be rough yeah. on your body and stuff mm -hmm. as an older, that's a good point. older woman. Like I'm mm -hmm. sure it's not easy to carry a child at that age and no. just, you know, all the normal struggles that come with it, but, and just, you want to be supported when you're going through that, yeah, right? Totally. Like it's well, like emotionally too, you you're carrying a child care. that's both of yours. Like it's not just yeah. your baby. So it m makes you feel pretty alone. If you're like going through that process, a lot of people would like to have a partner. Obviously she's feeling, you know, angry at him because here he is with his other six kids and his wife doing just fine. And she's like dealing with this on her own and doesn't have that supportive partner. Mm -hmm. So she's starting to feel angry at him and you can see it in those diary entries that she's just mad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's starting to resent. She's, and he's mad a, at her too. Him. Cause he's like, what the hell? Cause I think he probably wanted her to like terminate the pregnancy. Probably. Yeah. I'm he sure probably wasn't thrilled that. when she said that she was going to keep him mm -mm. or keep her. Mm -hmm. But I mean, luckily she did and she gave birth to her uh, daughter, Ava. Beautiful little girl. Yeah. And she, yeah. she obviously just, as soon as she had her daughter, she just fell in love with her and, mm -hmm. you know, loved her up and down and just was a great mom for her. Yeah. People said she was a really good mom, actually, that she was just super patient and really involved and into it, just like totally hands on. I mean, when you wait that long for a kid and you've just like been wanting a daughter so much and you like are blessed with this miracle child, I mean, you're going to give it everything you have. Yeah. Yeah. And she really did. So Ava was pretty lucky that she had her as her mom because she was so into it. So she mm -hmm. kind of made up for the fact that Tony wasn't even around. Right. Because even up till the time that Ava was one and a half years old, Tony's wife still had no idea mm -mm. that he had this other kid. Until Krista decided that it was time to clue her yeah. in. <laughs> like, yo. So she wrote a crazy note. I mean, this is insane. She decides to write a note to his wife. I don't know what her name is. Susan. She writes a note to Susan and it's basically like, hi, Susan, just so you know, I have been banging your husband for years and, <laughs> <Pretty much. laughs> and I just thought you should know. That's basically how it, how it's been like the first time that we hooked up, yep, it we were in was, bed for like eight hours, like yep. really trying to write something. And to when like he, sting. when you were thought he was picking up your son, he was actually fucking me word for word. That's what she said. So it was a, it was not like a woman to woman. Like I, like I feel so, so sorry. Bad. I had no, idea. no, it yeah. was like, this was meant to hurt her mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, right, so she was pissed and she was like, and by the way, we have a kid. So. Well, I mean, Ava, that, that, you know, one and a half, two years old, you're starting to be able to kind of t start to talk a little bit. Kids mm -hmm. are starting to figure shit out and they're going to start asking questions. We're like, where's dad? Yeah. Where, well, they're going to start you know? going to school soon and see other dads and be like, well, where the hell is my dad? Mm hmm. But the good thing that came of this is that Susan, Tony's wife, was actually very accepting. I mean, as much as you can be in this situation where she took, you know, was like happy to take Ava in and, and Kristen mm -hmm. in as family mm -hmm. in a sense. Like mm -hmm. she did. She wasn't good. happy, but she was, you know, yeah, at least willing to deal with the situation she was in. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people would freak the fuck out, be like a divorce, blow up, like. Then Tony oh, yeah. would be a you know single guy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like Susan invited them over for Sunday dinners. Like they they got like close and they started yeah. building a relationship with Ava, especially. That was mm -hmm. like their main goals. You they wanted her, him so. to have a relationship with her. Yeah. Because I'm sure Susan was like, you need to be there for your kid, dude. Yeah. So that kind of gives you a little bit of backstory on, you know, her and kind of the situation that she's in entering in to the fall of 2001 when, when mm -hmm. things kind of start to unravel. So mm -hmm. obviously in Cape Cod, it's way up North. And as the summer comes to a close, it gets mm -hmm. fucking cold up there. Like it turns oh, into a, a wasteland cold. up there. It looks yeah. like mm -hmm. there's nobody out. It's just cold as shit. Mm -hmm. You know, dude, that's where the pilgrims showed up to in oh. the snow, in the winter. They came in like December. <sighs> that must've been crazy as shit. Yeah, dude, they pulled up. They were like, <laughs> Damn it. Like, we should have planned this We were better. shooting for the Bahamas, but damn. <laughs> what is this place? This, this is the South Pole? Uh, yeah, that probably sucked really bad. But yeah, it gets really cold there. And especially in Truro, like all the tourists that come for the summer, people have summer houses there, mm -hmm. go back, you know. They mm -hmm. don't want to be there in the winter. So. Exactly. So there's so less people. So she was people. there. Yeah. 
It's a touristy town. Yeah, it's like a summer vacation destination. Mm -hmm. So she was out there still in the winter all by herself in her bungalow, um, you know, just trying to raise her kid. And at this time, she's 46 years old and a single mom way out in the Cape Cod all on her own. That's really scary. You know, I like cannot imagine that. I'm such a baby. I have gotten I was like, so used to. Can you handle to, that? Could you ever no, do that? No, I'm so used to having Josh home. Like, I don't even know what I would do if you had like business trips or something to go to. Like, I don't I'd know be what so you would scared. do. Like, oh, I know what I would do. I'd have her ass over your <laughs> sleepover. <laughs> yeah, you'd Janelle have Janelle would spend over the night. Here. <laughs> I would be really scared sleeping by myself. That like scares me so bad. I'm such a baby, especially if I had kids. Oh, I'd be a wreck. You can never leave. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, like, <laughs> if we had kids, I feel like you'd never let me not be there You're with you. You're a protector, like, okay? I'm <laughs> a protector. All right, <laughs> I'll take that. I'll wear that badge of honor. So, in Chris's story, it's now January 2002. And this is actually the last time that Krista is for sure seen alive, unfortunately. On January 4th, 2002, there's surveillance camera footage at a grocery store stop and shop where she can be seen with her daughter Ava sitting in a grocery cart as she's pushing her around the store. Um, this is it's just so eerie to think about mm -hmm. when you look at, you know, this is the last video pictures of this person she alive that we coming. have. And they're just, you think about where their mind state's at in these pictures and mm -hmm. you're just like, she's just at the grocery store, like mm -hmm. just like I Normal was. Day. And, mm -hmm not thinking about what could happen to you mm -hmm. for sure. Or what's about to unfold. It's just mm -hmm. crazy. So that's the last footage, January 4th, 2002. And then on the following Sunday, January 6th, 2002, four days later, or I'm sorry, two days later, this is when her body is discovered. So a man named Tim Arnold, who was somebody that who had dated Krista in the past and actually lived like, hundred yards mm -hmm. away, like just down the road from, from her. Well, picture it kind of like their houses were really close to each other, but you know, there's kind of some gnarly of, land yeah. in between them. So you wouldn't want to just like walk through the yards probably at night. No, no, no. So no. it would make sense to take, to the drive road. out, go out. Cause they're long driveways. Right. It's still quite a bit of land. Yeah. They're secluded. Like mm -hmm. the, the houses aren't right on the main street. Like they have long set driveways that go way back into some trees. So yeah. So Tim on January 6th decides to drive over to Krista's place because he, he wants to return a flashlight to her. Mm -hmm. That was his purpose for going over to her place. And this guy, Tim, um, interesting character, but bottom line is he had a very intense relationship with her. He lived with her for a while. Um, really smart, likable guy who's also a writer so somebody that she clearly was really close with at one time. And on this particular Sunday, uh, they were watching a Patriots game. And during the game, Tim's father, interesting enough, suggested to Tim that he go over to Chris's house to return her flashlight that he had borrowed. So Tim's father drove Tim to Chris's house. And as Tim was walking up to the front door, he noticed that there were two newspapers that were on her driveway that she hadn't collected. Because, yeah, you know, back then, that's how you told yeah. if somebody was home. Like, right. they could come out and get the paper every day. Mm -hmm. And he said that this was really strange and that when he looked through the front door window, that's when he saw Krista's body lying on the ground, motionless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he says that the door was unlocked, which is interesting. Because um, also the door did look like it was somewhat kicked open. in, like yeah. kicked in like from pictures. So, you know must have already been kicked in so he just kind of pushed it open and mm -hmm. went inside yeah um if that's what really happened but yeah he went over to her and he felt her face and it was completely cold and she wasn't wearing pants she just had a shirt on yeah yeah completely just bare covered in blood uh, bottom half of the body and just yeah brutally stabbed brutally stabbed yeah just yeah, a really gnarly and the hor worst thing about it is Ava was there. She was actually just sitting on the ground next to her mom. She had been using these like cotton swabs. She'd been like getting them wet in the sink and using them to like try to clean her mom yeah, off, God. which is like, I can't even put into words how horrific that is. I mean, it's the terrible. trauma that she witnessed. Yeah. And I can't endured imagine. that day is insane. Like I can't even imagine. Yeah. Literally like, 
I think at one point they said she was nursing on her, her mother and yeah, trying well, to clean her Tim up. Yeah, that's what said in the police, in the phone call. Yeah. So I'm imagining so. In the 911 call. On the 911 call, he talks about um, her nursing on her right, mother's right. body. But I'm not sure... If that's yeah, actually, we don't know we, how we much really of that know. is truth or not. But. I mean, there's a lot of like suspicion around Tim. I mean, first of all, why do you randomly decide to give bring the flashlight a flashlight back? over to, so to a single woman at home? Yeah. So and like to go with the dad, they like went out together. Like that's kind of yeah. And then when he got back after he told his dad that she was dead, his dad literally asked him like, "Wasn't his dad so in the Tim, car? Did you do it? Yeah. 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 When he, he told his dad, to his car. dad was like." So Tim, well, he did you came do out it? to the car, which was weird. And he said, Krista's dead and spelled it out D E A D because she, he grabbed Ava yeah. and brought her mm-hmm. out too. Yeah. His, he just seemed kind of shaky in the nine one one call. The whole thing was kind of weird, but I don't know. I mean, so he instantly gets put as a suspect, like the number one suspect. Yeah. Which makes sense. Cause I mean, whoever finds the body, you know, you never know. Yeah. And, and then they find out more about him. Right. Yeah, because he's he's like obsessed with her pretty much. Like mm-hmm. he's really into Krista and, you know, he has a long history of like kind of stalking her. Mm-hmm. And at one point he like went over to her property and decided that instead of like being a normal human and like ringing the doorbell. And he did. He's or he, he rang did. The yeah, doorbell it was something like a that. couple times, but then she didn't answer. So right. he looked, he was he probably was avoiding idea. him. And so he looked in the window and saw her and she was like really That's freaked out creepy. by that. Cause it's creepy. It's yeah. fucking creepy. If someone did that to you. You'd be like, what the fuck? So he had seemed like he had kind of an obsessive relationship with her. Like, we'll talk about that. They, kinda, they had a yeah. thing going on. But anyway, when, um, right after the police get there, um, his wife, uh, Tony and his wife got to the scene as well. So Tony and Susan, and one of the investigators says that Tony's wife, Susan said to him, don't listen to anything that the little girl has to say. She's a fucking liar about Ava which she says that it isn't completely true that she said that she made a joke about her like telling stories you know being a bit of a storyteller as a little girl um but the investigator is like no she said she was a fucking liar so we've never really figured out exactly what was said because she just denies that and she thinks it was like totally blown out of proportion but that made them seem suspicious as well yeah So police ended up taking Tim back to the station for more questioning. And then they took him back to his house. And that is when his dad said, Tim, did you do it? And he was like, no. So anyway, we'll go into the rest of the uh, suspects because that's not even that's like scratching the surface. There are so many suspects for this. It reminds me of like a game of Clue or something. There's so many possibilities. um, And we'll get into that after. As well as like the scene too, like what did the actual scene look like and yeah. what evidence was there? Explain it. But before we do, we'd like to thank our last sponsors for today. So you've probably heard about neighborhood watch groups, right? Which are just neighbors looking out for each other and trying to keep their community safe. Well, get this. The neighborhood watch is now an app on your phone. You might be wondering, how does that work? This app is called Neighbors and it's by Ring, which is an awesome company, which we love. And it's the company that's behind those awesome video doorbells and security cameras. With the Neighbors app, you receive real-time crime and safety alerts from your neighbors. Who doesn't want that? And it helps you stay informed about what's actually going on in your neighborhood, and it's completely free. Best of all, you don't even need to own a Ring device to use this app. We have actually been using Ring products for a while, and when they came out with Ring Neighbors, we were super excited about it because it allows you to know actually what's going on within your neighborhood. For example, it's great if you happen to have your dog get out, which we've had friends whose dogs have gone loose or other pets, cats, accidentally get out of the house and what's awesome is oftentimes they're spotted on people's ring cameras or people actually just post to the ring app but not only that personal home security is super important Kendall and I are actually moving because we have had some personal home security concerns here and what's great about the ring neighbors app is it allows you to know if there's people in your neighborhood that are doing sketchy things stealing packages kids ding dong ditching (laughs) or worse you know people trying to break into people's homes so it allows you to give your neighbors a heads up if you see suspicious activity going on and so everybody can stay safe and that's why millions of people are already using the ring neighborhood app because it is literally making neighborhoods and communities safer 
than ever before. So if you wanna help and make sure you and your neighborhood are safe, download the free Neighbors app today. Go to ring.com slash mile higher to download from iOS or Android app stores. That's ring.com slash mile higher. Make your neighborhood safer today with the Neighbors app by Ring. As most of us have found out the hard way, including myself, getting into debt is easy, but getting out is hard, especially if your FICO score isn't great. Sky high interest rates can make it incredibly hard for you to break out of that revolving debt cycle. Thankfully, now there's upstart.com, the revolutionary lending platform that offers smarter interest rates to help you pay off high interest credit card debt, which I know for me personally, if I had known about upstart a few years ago, when I was still digging myself out of credit card debt, I would have most definitely went and gotten an upstart loan because of that smarter interest rate. Because if you don't have great credit, then you get slammed with very high interest rates, which may even put you into debt more than you already are. What's great about Upstart is they go beyond your traditional FICO score or credit score when assessing your actual credit worthiness. They actually reward you based on your education and job history in the form of a smarter interest rate, which is great. So they don't ding you on the credit part of the application. Upstart believes you're more than just a credit score. They make it fast, simple, and easy to check your rate in just a few minutes without affecting your credit score. The best part is that once the loan is approved, most people get their funds the very next business day, the next day, which is great. Over 200,000 people have used Upstart to pay off credit cards, student loans, fund their wedding, or to make a large purchase. Free yourself from the burden of high interest credit card debt by consolidating everything into one monthly payment with Upstart. See why Upstart is ranked number one in their category with over 300 businesses on Trustpilot and hurry to upstart.com slash mile higher to find out how low your Upstart rate is. Checking your rate only takes a few minutes and it won't affect your credit, which is the best part. That's upstart.com slash mile higher. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the actual murder scene. So um, Krista's car was parked outside of her house and the keys were also outside of the house. Um, there was some small skid marks on the gravel leading up to the door as if someone or something had been dragged. Yeah, that's what's weird. And that's why investigators are like, there must have been some type of altercation out here. Yes. Because somebody got dragged. Like it's Inside. clearly drag marks. Of, yeah. And there's like, two feet. lines of like the heaviest points. Um, and then yeah. the front door was damaged. It looked like someone had kicked it in. Mm -hmm. um, and then just really damaged, yeah. like hardcore. Definitely. Someone like somebody kicked just it in. busted in. Oh, yeah. that's so scary. God, that must have been terrifying. But yeah, you know, we got a lot more information from the body. That's usually where police find mm -hmm. a lot of clues and also get gather information as to what happened to the victim. And on her body, they she had defensive wounds on her hands, mm -hmm. actually, as well as other places on which, her body. Which when someone has wounds on their hands, I mean, they're most likely it's from trying to fight back right. or save themselves. But the murder weapon was never found. Um, however, some investigators suggest that the murder weapon was actually a knife that was found on a cutting board in her kitchen. I feel like, though, I mean, how well did they have time to clean it like and leave the knife back there? There's still no way to grab DNA off of that, like to make I sure know. like and that's again, it's like the whole thing is either mm -hmm. we're not getting all of the information released mm -hmm. or they just straight up fucked up and they didn't test everything well, for DNA. And this is what Josh and I were talking about a lot earlier today is just how unprepared a lot of police stations are for murders like this, especially in towns like Turo. Yeah. Turo what is it? It's like half a century that there were since yeah, last time there was like a literally had like never happened there like this before. So the police were completely under prepared for something like this. And the crime scene was just a mess. I mean, the worst thing that they did was put a blanket on top of her, which yeah, I think they were trying yeah. to like, you like, know, show decency right. and cover her bottom half because she was naked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's but that just, contaminates uh, the body with whatever's major, on the blanket dude. and stuff. Oh yeah. yeah. Like the, and it's another piece of evidence in the house. They're using one piece of evidence right. to cover a body. Like it's just basic CSI. You wouldn't do that. Yeah. As but, well as not taping off the crime scene itself. Like yeah. you always, always, Ooh. always tape the crime scene. Uh, and create a perimeter around it and protect it mm -hmm. because that is where all of the information, mm -hmm. the forensics are. Mm -hmm. And they didn't do that at all in this place. And I mean, her, her, and that was another thing is her cottage looked like it had been ransacked, but it, yeah. from what we know about Krista, that's just kind of how she lived in kind of like a chaotic She's messy, house, yeah. like mm -hmm. kind of shit everywhere. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it looks, it looks crazier than it, it actually is as far as 
her house. You know, when you look at the crime scene photos of her house, Mm -hmm. it looks like really messy, but that's just how it was. And then of course, um, Oh, her cell phone. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Her cell phone was left on the counter with just the number nine dialed. So she was probably calling 911 and wasn't able to complete the call, which is really freaky. Um, So it makes you think, I mean, she was probably conscious and knew something. I mean, just knowing her in that moment, she must have been so scared knowing that her daughter was home too. And like there was a threat to her as well. Um, And, you know, when her body was found. Ava was just sitting near her on the floor. She had been under unattended for over 24 hours at this point. And when investigators came in, I mean, they had no idea what to, they're not prepared for something like that. I mean, this girl's seen major trauma. This oh, is yeah. super fucked up. There's blood everywhere. Yeah. She's trying to give she was her, trying to clean her get water stuff. for her mom yep, and washcloth. And, yeah, like and give her a little spoonfuls of water oh, and stuff. God. And so sad. It's, see if she could, I'm sure she didn't even like know what was going on. And, you know, so the investigator goes in there and he's like trying to find out just if she's been changed or when the last time she ate something and like she was just completely silent, Mm -hmm. um, totally freaked out. And this was so obviously clearly a murder, a killing like this was very, there's no questions about it. Like Mm -mm. somebody came in here and wanted to hurt her. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's exactly what they did because. You know, at first it was like, did somebody break in? Was it like a robbery gone wrong? And, mm-hmm. you know, she just ended up getting killed because someone wanted to steal stuff. But then they realized right. that that wasn't the case. It was literally somebody was out to get her and they busted in and yep. and, and did exactly that. So that's just uh, so crazy. So, yeah, there's just some pictures of of the actual house, uh, the crime scene, which I'll put mm-hmm. up. Really um, messy. Yeah, just the house is a complete mess. Mm hmm stuff everywhere but again not from the incident most likely just how it was how she yeah how she uh-huh. lived but obviously in a, in a small place or a small town like Truro word got out about what had happened mm-hmm. and people were just like shocked and upset and like oh my god i can't believe this happened this is so terrible there's a killer out there like what the hell's going on um and this is when at, at first fingers started pointing at tim mm-hmm. because i mean it's the most logical suspect well and what we point. haven't told you about tim yet is that they we find out that krista and tim had a emotional and yes. physical and they, they argued had a, a, a lot. relationship yes yes and well yeah but they also had just a relationship we haven't even explained yeah. that they were seeing each other yeah 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 they were hooking they were up exes. yeah exactly yeah. and more than that he became somewhat of a father figure ish hard ish there to ava um, but to the point where he would even want to, you know, see her after they were together. Like he yeah. saw her as somewhat of a child to him mm-hmm. in a way. And, um, but yeah, she, they fought a lot. They were arguing over a little thing. She was criticizing him over everything such as even humming or sneezing too much. The one thing that he did a lot was humming. And she would say that she didn't want Ava right. to start being a hummer. Right, right. And he would just call her like over and over and leave messages and just weird things. And here, here's one of the voicemails. Um, it's just really weird. Hi, just calling to check and see if you have plans for the night yet. Bye. Hi, Sunday morning around eight. Would you like to go have coffee? Are you around? I thought you would be up. I'm sorry if you're not. Hi, Krista. Um, what's up with with the movie? Is that um, is that a problem? Is, is did I call too early? I mean, I get the feeling that this is one of those things where you say you'll call back and you're not going to. And I wondered what this is all about, if anything. So give me a call if you can, would you? Thanks. Well, I think you've made it very clear where you stand on the issue of friendship, so I, at this point, don't expect me to be around it. Hi, Chris, uh, just to clarify, if you wanted to call to try to arrange for um, time for me to see Ava, that would be fine, and I'll, uh, I'll see what I can do. But I don't really think that we should see each other, even briefly. Bye. What do you think about that? 
I mean, it sounded kind of weird, but people were talked really weird on the phone back yeah, then. Yeah, I mean, it seemed like pretty normal voicemail messages. Yeah. A little odd. Like, I feel like mm-hmm. if we're not her, we're all going to think that's just like weird and bizarre. And like, mm-hmm. but if that's just how he is and that's how. Mm-hmm. Well, we're clearly missing like tons of the actual conversation that they're having in actual life, not. Yeah. Over the phone. Totally. Yeah. And voicemails. I mean, just, it's hard to figure out what was going on. Or what their level of friendship was mm-hmm. after they were Well, together. I think she clearly like got kind of weirded out by him starting to yeah. kind of break it off. Yeah. Yeah. And he was having he a hard was time having with a hard that. Time with that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean he a lot of people were pointing at him as possibly the person who could have committed these acts um, mm-hmm. on Krista. Maybe he, you know, one of those classic if if I can't have her, no one can type of situation. Mm-hmm. So obviously Tim was a suspect, but a lot of people around him were saying that this just isn't something that Tim would do, that it was out of his character and they ended up finding nothing that could tie him to the death of Krista. So they eventually just had to move on. So he's not like ruled out. Yeah, he definitely yeah. hasn't been like ruled out as a possibility. I think it's possible he could have done it. To be honest, we don't know yeah. who did it. Yeah, there just wasn't enough to to really link him to yeah, anything. There or wasn't to, any evidence to link him other than, I guess, him bringing the flashlight. But that's right. not evidence of no. him having been there. No, There's no DNA of him there. There's no fingerprints of him there. There's nothing like that. Plus, the crime scene was a mess. So the police basically hit a dead end with Tim. So then they're turning to Tony and Susan because of her comment, mainly because she said, this child's a fucking liar. Right. Um, which, again, we're not for sure that she even said that we don't know she seemed very adamant that she did not say that so i'm not sure um but i i do think it's kind of a strange time to make a joke about a kid being a liar even if you were joking like that just seems like a very strange time when they just lost their mom to be like don't believe anything they say yeah like (laughs) very weird i I wonder if if ava's ever had any like they didn't ever like interview her obviously she's a baby yeah and she well yeah and even now she's she doesn't remember anything. No, doesn't want to be involved in it. Either. Yeah. I mean, gosh, it's so traumatizing. I understand that. But I mean, I get why investigators went to them and were like, mm-hmm. okay, well, let's look at who mm-hmm. else was close to her. Maybe you know? Susan did it because, right. I mean, first of all, they found those notes that she had right. written and, you know, they look really bad because they were so angry sounding. Yeah, and, they were. You know, they could have clearly fired up something in Susan and made her snap potentially yeah, it, it's happened before. So why not consider mm-hmm. that at least? And that's what they're, they were thinking is uh-huh. it's a possibility that she may have gotten angry enough and did something. But why like, think about it. Why would she want to kill the mother of Ava when she's, I'm sorry, I'm shaking this table so much. Um, <laughs> We're in so, we have like a literally we have a card table with our old uh, thing from our yeah. festival on top. Anyway. Um, no, why would. Yeah. Why would she want to kill Ava's mother when does she want to then be in charge of Ava all the time? Because guess who's getting her next? You know, yeah, if, it's, Tony, if yeah. yeah, like it seems like stupid to kill off her caretaker of this child. It doesn't really make a lot of sense, especially when she, they were trying to have a relationship. She was inviting them over for dinners and stuff like that. But also it just doesn't make sense to like out of anybody. Shouldn't she kill Tony for <laughs> doing it to her in the first place? Yeah, like, but she definitely could have had her anger more. But she was like, he her. was just a naughty boy. Yeah. She called him a naughty boy. It's like, seriously, he's a naughty Tony. After all that, you're just like, he was a naughty boy. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, they gave them polygraph tests and they did pass. Mm -hmm. Uh, the polygraph test which I mean doesn't prove anything but Mm -mm. it does show that they were you know likely not lying about what had happened or that they were involved with Chris's death all right so after Susan and Tony have the polygraph test investigators you know were doing some more digging into into their background and they found out there was a lot of pressure being put on Tony to help provide for Ava like we talked about Mm -hmm. but specifically Krista wanted Tony to put Ava on his health insurance and wanted to help provide them with financial support. Mm -hmm. She even hired a lawyer and threatened to sue Tony if he didn't help, you know, start helping with Mm -hmm. Ava, which is only fair. Yeah. And because of all this, investigators were wondering if maybe Tony did something to Krista because he wanted to get her basically off his back and not, Mm -hmm. you know, provide those things, which, but again, what is the point of killing your daughter's mom? Cause then you're going to have, a, you know, a child to take care of, which in reality he ends up not taking care of her anyway. No. She moves in with one of 
Krista's friends. Yeah, and actually, was raised by her. But um, in her will, Krista put that her friend uh, Amira Chase would have guardianship of Ava if something mm-hmm. were to happen to her. Mm-hmm. And because of this, Tony did go through like a custody battle to try to get custody of Ava. So during this time, the custody battle is all in turn slowing down the investigation and police are not getting anywhere farther with Tony. Mm -hmm. So they have to look elsewhere and look at other suspects who, who could have done this to Krista. And this is when they came across a very interesting fellow named um, Thomas Churchwell. He was a magician actually. Mm -hmm. Um, And basically they went to him and pretty much were like, you did this right. And he was like, yo, I didn't just because I'm a magician doesn't mean, you know, I would do something like this. That's pretty much how he put it. Like the police literally came to him and, you know, cause they're just running out of leads. And they thought and, only a magician could pull this off. Right. That's the stupidest logic I've ever. The, the, the guy was like, what are you uh, talking about? It must about? be the magician that did this then guys case closed. So yeah. So they didn't find anything further with uh, Thomas Churchwell. Um, so they had to continue looking at one point, even Chris's own father and his girlfriend were considered potential suspects, which Chris's father who was 72 at the time and his girlfriend was a uh, 29 years old, an ex heroin addict and also a former prostitute. And investigators mm-hmm. believe that maybe Elizabeth was the one who killed Krista because she wanted to get the money from her sugar daddy because he was wealthy. Like mm-hmm. was she trying to get her out of the way so that she could inherit it? Well, basically like some- she was taking already hacking into like a bunch of their money, like their estate because he was help supporting her heroin addiction and all like buying her a bunch of things and just a ton of money was going towards her. And Krista was get, trying to get that shut down. Right. Um, and make sure that he wasn't kind of being a victim of a sweetheart swindle, which I'm doing a video on a sweetheart swindle this week, but it's basically when a young person takes advantage of an old person with money and tries to live off of them. Yeah. And it happens. And I mean, sugar daddy, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's a possibility. I mean, I get why the investigators looked at that. It's definitely a plausible situation that, that could have led to her death for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and they actually both took a polygraph test and they surprisingly didn't pass, but despite this, yeah, interesting. So they didn't, I mean, you don't know, like polygraphs are so unreliable, but they're not that unreliable though. They still do a pretty good job at, yeah, I I know, but they just don't hold up at all. Like as far as real evidence goes, no, they don't hold up in court because they literally don't, I mean, they don't prove anything at the end because they're not completely reliable at all. Yeah, but I don't know. I think it's still it's still able to, you know, could they be deceiving because you either pass a flying colors or you don't. And there's scientific reasons behind polygraphs. So Mm -hmm. if they're not passing a polygraph, there is a very good chance, at least whether it's 100 percent or not, that they're not being truthful about some stuff. So maybe could they've been or they're nervous. I mean, there's a billion different reasons. We don't know. At the end of the day, we don't know. So after the police, you know, kind of rule out. Chris's dad and and his girlfriend, they really didn't have anywhere else to turn to. Like they Mm -hmm. didn't have any more leads. They really didn't have any more suspects. Um, The list was just growing. So there, there are so many, so many suspects in fact that they had to figure out a way to kind of narrow it down Mm -hmm. and, you know, try to at least get somebody that could be matched up with the DNA at the crime scene, which Mm -hmm. we, you know, if you remember, we, they completely fucked that up. They Mm -hmm. contaminated it. There's fingerprints all over the place. So there's no way to actually like pull any, specific prints or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And as far as on Chris's body, there was saliva, sperm uh, and DNA on on her body from an unknown person. Which by the fact that she wasn't wearing pants, you can assume some type of of sexual. uh, Probably. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So because of these findings, police believe that Krista was involved in possibly some type of intimate relationship before she was killed or during Mm -hmm. it or something like Mm -hmm. that. And at this point, the police put out a $25,000 reward to find out, you know, who was the DNA match. They were trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Um, And with no signs of a DNA match in January of 2005, they decided to do something very controversial known as a DNA dragnet, which basically they asked all male residents who lived in Truro, which was about 700 of them, to give DNA samples like willingly. That's unbelievable that they would do that. I've and, never and they were heard aggressive with it. They'd like approach you in public, be like, yeah, here's a test. And if you don't take it, then that was also part of their reason for doing it is yeah. they wanted to see who didn't want right. to take like, it. Oh, no, well. no, no, I'm not doing that. Yeah. Cause like mm-hmm. if you're innocent, you're, you, know, yeah. you should Line just up. get your mouth swabbed. No problem. Give the DNA, but yeah, 
But that's such an invasion of privacy. It's crazy. So because of this DNA dragnet, this case really kind of got elevated into national headlines. Like people started really hearing about this because this was kind of unheard of. It's yeah. very controversial to do this thing, mm -hmm. uh, a dragnet. And, you know, it's often frowned upon because it's just yeah. very, yeah, it's very it's invasive. Total and yeah, yeah people it's are mad. putting people in positions they don't want to be in. Mm -hmm. And because of this, you know, things did not get better for the case at all. Like they didn't narrow down the suspects or anything really until three years later, they got a match for the DNA on her body mm -hmm. and it led them back to an individual named Christopher McCowan. And they went and found this guy on April 15, 2005. And he was actually her garbage man. And he kind of has an interesting story. Um, he, seems to have been kind of screwing a bunch of ladies on his garbage route. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of seems like what was the, that was the deal. I mean, from what he was saying that there were multiple women like consenting and hook up with on sex his, with him. Yeah. On the garbage his, route. Yeah. The garbage man. Man. <laughs> so it sounds like he was having a relationship with Krista of some sort. Right. N maybe not a relationship, but a sexual had relationship. Had an encounter with encounter. her. A sexual mm -hmm. encounter with her. Could have been once, could have been more than once. We're right. not exactly sure. Because they matched the DNA from the crime scene to Chris. And that's mm -hmm. the whole thing is that, um, you know, the DNA didn't come from this dragnet, but instead uh, they actually had his DNA from Chris's body one year prior to his arrest. Actually, mm -hmm. that was what's crazy is they actually had his DNA. Mm -hmm. They just never connected the dots or it I took know. that long for it to get processed or something. Yeah, this crazy case like was that. a mess. But once the word got out that Chris McCohen had been matched, the public started questioning police on why they didn't bother looking into this person, especially the fact that he picked up her trash every week. Like mm -hmm. why did instead, you know, before jumping to a giant dragnet, wouldn't mm -hmm. you go look at every mail she yeah. comes into contact with on, yeah. a, on a daily, weekly basis? Like, yeah, it seems stupid. It seems pretty basic thing to miss. And so at first, I mean, I kind of jumped ahead, but he did tell them at first that he like hardly knew her. Um, so, I mean, he wasn't just like straight up like, oh yeah, I was like banging all these women on my, on my route after a while, after questioning, he started talking about that. Right. But, um, at, yeah, at first he was trying to act like he hardly knew her. Right. And he wasn't an individual that was super well known on, uh, on, you know, in that area at mm -hmm. all. Before he was a trash man, he had worked for a moving company in Cape Cod. He was a pretty quiet guy, mm -hmm. kept to himself. He had three kids from three different mothers and was 33 at the time that he was arrested for Chris's murder. And despite his DNA matching, a lot of people knew him, mm -hmm. said that Chris was definitely not the type of person to commit this crime. Yeah, tons um, of people came to yeah. his defense just saying like, the, no way. He's just a really mellow dude. He wouldn't do anything like this. But then you kind of hear there's, there's some more to him that makes you kind of question, could he have done something like this though? Yeah, um, he had some criminal uh, criminal history for yeah, sure. Yeah, there were women reporting that he... He had restraining I orders. I can't find the part in here exactly what it says. But yeah, he had multiple restraining orders from different women mm -hmm. who said things like, he scared me. Strangled. Strangled me. Yeah. Behavior that yeah. could indicate some type of domestic violence yeah. on females. Is he capable of it? So, Which makes sense for why he I mean, be. there's plenty of people that are really, really nice when you meet them that secretly they abuse women or abuse whoever behind the scenes. Like so it's even not though, always yeah, who you think it would be. Exactly. And even though, you know, you may not seem like the type of individual personality wise that might be able to do something like that. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you're not capable of it. Mm -hmm. And I think people forget that a lot. Cause like, Oh, he's just a friendly neighborhood trash guy. You yeah. Know? But then those people end up being like a serial killer or something. Yeah. Have no idea. It's possible. That's just kind of how it goes sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Cause people are like, he wasn't a fighter. He was never known to have any type of violence and you know, people that knew him quote unquote. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So people also, cause this guy is, African-American and a lot of people started thinking that, you know, maybe the police were targeting him because he was a minority in Cape Cod mm -hmm. and therefore like people would see him as like scary, mm -hmm. quote unquote. Well, I mean, Cape Cod is like super whitewashed. There's only 1.2% of the population that's black. So, I mean, the, a lot of people were like, are you guys just jumping to conclusions with him because he's like, right a big scary black man like that's how they that's described how they him described in court him, yeah. literally in court they used words like big and 
So is there some racial profiling yeah. going on in a way? I mean, there's DNA here too. Right. DNA doesn't but, lie, but just from that DNA, you can't, you can't determine prove. if he killed her. Like, right. That's the whole right. thing. Could, mm-hmm. did he have some type of sexual encounter? Cause it was mm-hmm. back to, I believe his sperm was what it was. Yes. So the DNA was sperm. And here's the match. thing with the sperm is after they looked under a microscope, they discovered that the sperm was deteriorated that they didn't have tails. Like they yeah. couldn't even swim anymore. So they were days old. So it could have been from days before she was mur- murdered or yeah, a day before right. she was murdered right. or something like that. Yeah. It doesn't prove the two mm-hmm. coincide with each other, you know? Mm-hmm. So, and just because his sperm was found there, that doesn't mean that he raped her. It right, could mean right. they had a consensual relationship because we do find out he did have multiple relationships with women on his trash route. Exactly. And so that's why it, it people got that feeling that maybe he was being targeted because the prosecution and prosecutors brought, mm-hmm. you know, all the charges, rape, murder charges for him. Mm-hmm. And we're really trying to like, you know, throw everything at him, you know, Definitely. And, and, and convict him. So prior to Chris becoming prime suspect, when they were looking at the other suspects, rape was never something that was even mentioned or brought up. Like that Mm -hmm. was a brand new thing they brought into the table when they got Chris and Mm -hmm. arrested Chris for these uh, crimes. Mm -hmm. They put the rape on him. Mm -hmm. And I mean, again, there was the sperm that was found, but you know, is there enough to to charge him with that? Mm -hmm. So now we're getting into Chris's trial, which Chris's trial was the trial of the century for Cape Cod. Most people living there had never witnessed a murder happen in their area. So this was like a huge deal, as you can possibly imagine. Mm-hmm. The media and the press were all over it, oh, filming yeah. it. It was uh, filmed. And during the trial, one of the prosecutors disclosed that during the first two interviews they had with Chris, Chris talked about not knowing or having anything to do with Krista. However, the third time that they spoke with him, they gave him the DNA match results. And this is when prosecutors claim that Chris said, quote unquote, it could have been me. Which he's been asked about this later. And again, the police the tactics that they use to try to force confessions from people are very Mm -hmm. shady and sometimes Mm -hmm. and just way over the top and Mm -hmm. they grill you because they're trying to get something. And when they're not, they have all these dead ends. They're going to push really hard. And that's what Chris said. First with Tim Mm -hmm. originally, when he was trying to say, I didn't do it, they were apparently telling him, yes, you did. Um, You know, being very forceful about it. And then we find out that, Chris, not only was he being, you know, kind of coerced in a certain direction, he also was under the influence of several different things while he was being interviewed. Yeah, when he got arrested, he was all Mm -hmm. fucked up. Yeah, yeah, on a bunch of different things, he said. He was like, I barely knew what was going on. He was, yeah, yeah, not in like a sober state of mind by any means. So he barely remembers like what he said, so. I think that's just so shady when mm-hmm. when they try to do that they try to put words in your mouth and mm-hmm. use it against you i mean in, there's so many court. cases of that it's crazy it's it's honestly fucked that they do that <coughs> but basically um chris admitted that he was asked by krista to come into her house that day to dispose of her christmas tree um that was still in her house and then after coming into her house to help her with the tree the two just kind of ended up you know getting mm-hmm. on in the living room mm-hmm. and yeah, I mean, I haven't really, he hasn't really gotten into too much detail about how it went down, but mm-hmm. he just all said he said is the reason he attraction. didn't want to tell them is because she didn't want anyone to know. Right. And they agreed was, to keep it like a right. secret. And he was trying to protect her, which makes sense. I mean, if that's what she asked for, and he seems like, yeah. And I mean, he also didn't know what the fuck was going on the first time they interviewed him. So that's mm-hmm. probably why he didn't mention that. So then prosecutors, <laughs> so then prosecutors also said that Chris mentioned that he wasn't the only person at the house during that time. According to the prosecution, Chris said that one of his friends named Jeremy Frazier actually drove him home to Chris's house after him and Jeremy were at the party that night. She was killed. Prosecutor said that Chris told them he was, he was pretty drunk and he didn't want to get caught drunk driving. So Jeremy agreed to drive him to Chris's house so that Chris could hook up with her. And remember, this is all coming from the, yeah, the first prosecution. Of all, he says he doesn't DA remember yeah. seeing this. And he also said that he was, you know, messed up on a bunch of things right. at this point right. during this interview. But uh, this is their version of events, according to what he said. Right. 
Because he his version of what <coughs> happened that night is completely different. He well, here's called. another sketch thing: is he chose to not have his interviews recorded by police. Yeah, which is some weird Massachusetts rule, I guess. Like this isn't a thing anywhere else. But if you don't want to be recorded, you can opt out of it. Although they recommend you do it because it just helps keep a better yeah, reflection of what happened. Who wants to write down every yeah. word you well, say? Well, they can like twist interview. what you say. Yeah. Like, I mean, it ends up being, it ends up screwing you over. I think he thought he was like protecting himself in some way, but it makes it worse for you. Yeah, it does. You um, want the full transparency of what's yeah. actually said. So they were just reading what he said. Yeah. And I think, I think they even <coughs> said that the interview was, the interview is extremely long. And for how long the interview went, there should have been like hundreds of pages of notes written. And instead the detectives that were working with Chris um, trying to prosecute him had like 27 pages for the whole thing. And, you know, the person that is writing those notes and going to end up giving them to the judge has a lot of leeway over what's in there. Mm -hmm. And so they really were able to kind of craft their own version of events and kind of put, you know, the story, plant it in a way, plant the mm -hmm. story and, Kind of force him into accepting it so the investigators basically say that chris said that he and jeremy went to the house after they were at this like juice bar having a nice little party juice over bar. there yeah it wasn't a juice bar that's what they were calling it a juice bar i think that was the name of it but they were doing hip-hop and stuff They're yeah like, but that was like a thing back then this is like the, the juice early, bar. yeah i don't know they're at the juice bar the local <laughs> cape cod juice bar and afterwards he says he basically what according to what he originally said again we're we not sure, sure if, if that, this what is was true but according to their version of events he is horny basically and is too drunk to drive so jeremy drives him over to krista's house right. they go in to get and he basically call. says like yeah i'm tipsy and i just want to get some and she's like all right cool i'm down and they go upstairs and do that and meanwhile, Jeremy's rummaging through her house yeah, stealing and things. stealing things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And takes some stuff. Mm -hmm. And so they come down and she notices that there's some stuff gone. Yeah, so as him. they're leaving in the driveway, she right. walks out yeah. and starts yelling at him and saying like, what the hell will give me my stuff back. And he wigs on her, starts punching her. And according to their test or their, uh, whatever Chris Version said, of events, yeah. Chris apparently joins in as well, starts beating on her. Mm -hmm. And then that would explain the drag marks outside, drags her into the house. And that's where Jeremy grabs a knife and stabs, and stabs Chris her. in the chest. Yeah. And, you know, Chris says that uh, he never was involved with the actual killing, that right, he wouldn't have right, killed yeah. someone. So that was kind of like their story. But then he, you know, was like, no, well, I was really fucked up when I told you guys all of that. And mm -hmm. I don't even remember. So he, yeah, he's I mean, now saying nothing. that didn't happen at all. Yeah. And he didn't even, he wasn't even there that night at all. Right. And that he actually just went home after mm -hmm. that and that mm -hmm. he was never there. That's his current version. So, of yeah. and that's, what's weird is because when we explore Jeremy a bit more, there's some weird sketchiness with him mm -hmm. um, in the trial as well. Cause yeah, there's all these conflicting stories and it makes us really confusing as to what really happened that mm -hmm. night. Cause we just really don't know. There's all these versions of events mm -hmm. and you know, we don't have even have the official, we don't have no recordings of the interviews and stuff. Mm -hmm. So we don't really know what was said. No. Um, but what's interesting is that, um, so the defense argued that because he was so high on the drugs that he was most likely not comprehending what was going on mm -hmm. and that he didn't have the clear mindset when he was giving his statement. Mm -hmm. Um, and they also stated that he had a very low IQ and was just above someone considered to have a severe mental disability and that he was exposed to being manipulated by the police because of this. And that, you know, he probably was forced to say a lot of things that weren't true um, that kind of helped his uh, mm -hmm. defense case. Mm -hmm. So not only was the whole interview process pretty sketchy, but there's also nothing to tie Chris directly to this crime scene. Um, except for the degraded semen that was found on her body, but that could have been earlier. You don't know if that was right. done An earlier at the encounter crime scene. between them, which mm -hmm. he said he did have. So he yeah, did admit I mean, to that. he did go into her house to get the Christmas mm -hmm. tree the day before. So that was the murder was on a Friday, and he was with her on a Thursday. 
Um, so and there it was, is one day apart. Yeah, but. there was like literally no fingerprints, no footprints for mm -hmm. Chris. Mm -hmm. And what's weird is there was DNA from three three other individuals found under her fingernails. Which is a huge yeah. bit here. Yeah. I mean, that's so telling that there's obviously more people involved. Yeah. And if the, that DNA, none of that DNA is Chris's, that's huge because yeah. that's her attacker's DNA that's under her nails. Mm -hmm. So it's, I know, it's looking pretty There's sketchy. no evidence to suggest that he murdered her, period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, it's all circumstantial. It's, yeah, very circumstantial. So there were also these clothing fibers that were found on her body, and they were blue and white. And Chris was not wearing any sort of blue or white during the night of her death. In fact, he was actually seen at the party wearing a black jersey. There's a picture of him, not even the type of you know material that no. like sheds. No, no. Um, and then Jeremy Frazier was wearing a blue and white sweater that night at the party. That so, fibers could have fallen mm -hmm. off of if he had gotten close to her. It's like a sick little polo he had on. Which Jeremy, he from day one swear he had nothing to do with the murder and that mm -hmm. the night of the murder, he was at a party with Chris. And then later that night, they all split up and he stayed the night at his friend uh, Sean's house. Yep. And during the trial, Sean also talks about how Jeremy was really wasted at the party. And that's why he took him home. To his house as opposed to letting him go yep. somewhere with chris or get in a car and drive drunk uh -huh. to chris's house or something which right does kind of make sense and another important factor was that the fact that chris's neighbors told police the day before that she was found that he when he was out on a walk he found someone with a black car speeding out yeah. of chris's driveway flying down the road that's a the, so, there's something and they can't figure out that. what car that was no or who was it or and the dude happened. who saw it was like very like it was insane he was driving very fast out of here mm -hmm. definitely caught his attention well and he even testified in court he was like mm -hmm. they were like who, what did you see or who did you see and he said it was some type of white caucasian man yeah that was driving the car speeding well, then, out which could have been somebody completely innocent but at the same There's time, a lot of white men in Cape Cod. True. 700 true. of them, apparently. But the way that the car came out, so he said he said he wouldn't have even noticed it if the car hadn't literally been like gunning it out of the driveway, not even Turo. stopping to turn onto the main road, but mm -hmm. just like skidding mm -hmm. around the corner and, and taking Calling off down the road. Yeah. Out of there, yeah. Like clearly trying to get get the hell out of there quickly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's definitely something going on with that. So basically the defense comes back and they state that they believe that what had happened that night was actually completely different than what the prosecution was trying to say happened that night. They basically said that Chris never even went to Krista's house after leaving the party. And instead he was actually at Krista's house the day before this, that lines up, you know, the whole Christmas tree thing. This would have been a Thursday for trash pickup. Um, and he was on his route. She called him to come inside, help her remove the tree. They it honestly makes a ton of sense. Yeah, that story does. checks out. Yeah. And with the type of Krista did like to have like fun, yeah, right. You know, she, she was spontaneous wasn't like, yeah. type sex like that. Yeah. where It's just like, it's on the spot, mm -hmm. not planned, like mm -hmm. boom, boom, you know, right there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I mean, it, it makes complete sense. Yeah, it really does. And then the fact that they're charging this, this guy with rape when there's literally no evidence to suggest that no there was evidence. any type of force injury you'd expect to see like, you know, strangle marks or something like that, where somebody was trying to forcefully mm -hmm. enact, you know, sex on somebody. And yeah. that wasn't the case at all. There right. was nothing there. So literally it seems like there's really nothing like the, mm -hmm. the prosecution literally has nothing other than nothing solid this story that they have initial testimony Jeremy. where he's fucked up is like their best, best case. Yeah. yeah best yeah. evidence. So he's getting um, tried for his life. Yeah. On that fucking argument, really serious which and is so crazy the jury was made up of 12 people obviously like every jury but one only one of them was black and she talked about how it was just terrible being on this jury and that she felt like from day one everyone else had decided that he was guilty immediately and she was the only one giving him the benefit of the doubt saying well what if he didn't do it yeah and that she would fight with everyone there she felt totally like left out and you know and that so, they were giving her shit like like mm -hmm. honestly expressing racist behavior yeah, sometimes and yeah. just being racially insensitive and things like that mm -hmm. by using those terms that we talked about big black and you know things like that yeah the, um, during oh, the uh deliberation yeah well not the jury but yes the uh the prosecution was using descriptive words like big and black and just words that were very questionable as far as like but are even they trying she to said make they were saying like black and like just the way that they were talking about it felt very racist yes racially mm -hmm. charged in a way but i mean there's a lot of people that 
don't think it was racially charged at all. And yeah. they will argue it's DNA. Right. We're talking about DNA here. And at the end of the day, his DNA is at the crime scene. So it's, it is hard. And he does have this past. He had, you know, restraining orders before it's difficult. Is there enough to say he's, he did this? Right. Absolutely. Not. Is there a reasonable doubt? No way that he did not do this. Yeah. Is and there enough that's what they're looking for present. is reasonable doubt. They are not saying reasonable suspicion that it happened like you can't just be like i'm pretty sure someone did this you have to be 100 percent sure to convict someone and get the whole jury of 12 people to agree and so even though there's that one woman kind of holding out for him and trying to be on his side they actually ended up coming back with their uh verdict after eight days of yeah, deliberation God. and on november 16th 2006 chris was found guilty of first degree murder yep. rape and burglary and sentenced to life without parole yeah. Which is crazy. He got like three life sentences. He got I thought. So, like he got majorly screwed. So fucked over that. Cause like And the poor guy, when he got the news, he's balling. just in court he's crying balling. like yeah. such true emotion. Like he, he, he just doesn't Can you imagine seem like that it. feeling? Like if you really didn't do something being sentenced That'd for be life? An, can that, you even imagine? No, no. The, the stress. Like they're oh my gosh. I they really just can't. ended your life basically. They mm -hmm. just took your entire life away from you and you had kids. Yeah. And like, all for all we know, he could have been a great friend to Krista and they could have had a great Yeah, you a know, great relation or just a great encounter and whatever. like it was a happy, it was a happy memory happy me for her. Yeah. And sh if she had seen him like in court, yeah, she'd have been like, she'd Oh my like, god, this you're is the wrong one. Yeah. You're on trial for my death. Yeah, like, because it's not about finding someone to be guilty it's about finding the actual person who did it or else you're not getting justice for anybody you know and i feel that so many of these uh the state system wants to find a find a suspect and convict them and wrap it up because well, it they're looks under pressure by the public having and an by, unsolved crime totally yeah and it's better politically for them for re-election mm -hmm. the sheriff and things like that or mm -hmm. whoever's in charge of of the da's office things like that want to get cases closed up so they felt like they had a strong strong case based upon circumstantial evidence mm -hmm. and a little bit of dna that they did have to to convict them and they did they got a they got a guilty verdict mm -hmm. which is just crazy and I guess there were actually three jurors that came out and said that they were manipulative or manipulated into finally giving that guilty verdict because they were somewhere, you know, on the fence and they felt like there were members of the jury who were just straight up racist. Yeah. And because so. of this, you know, the defense attorney for Chris mm -hmm. was like, we want a hearing about this mm -hmm. to see if we can get a new trial and stuff. Yeah, but they, they wanted to file a motion to talk about race bias in yeah. the trial but, and uh, in the jury. Yeah. They, uh, the appeal for the new trial, though, got shut down and the yeah. judge decided the verdict would stand in uh, December 2010. It went all the way up to the Massachusetts Supreme yeah, Court. Yeah, and they were pointing out things like the fact that they called him scary and big and black. I mean, the fact they called him scary, like as the descriptor. So yeah. like, what so, the hell? So fucked you. Yeah. yeah. So 11 years behind bars, um, sentenced to life in prison. And what's crazy is he never had like the opportunity to get on the witness stand and tell his version of events. That was mm -hmm. the thing is he wishes he could go back and actually would have taken explain it, yeah. like what had happened really clearly. He made the decision not to. And yeah, he thought in, himself, yeah. that Probably it might advised. help his case, which it seemed like based upon the defense that they kind of had a good case against the prosecution to get an acquittal for this because mm -hmm. there really wasn't anything to tie him to murder for sure. So it should have at least been acquitted for that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, they, tr they got him on all three charges. Just crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so actually in 2017, uh, Chris did a phone interview with Sonny Hostin. And apparently the Department of Corrections wouldn't allow a filmed interview to take place like at the jail. Mm -hmm. So they had to do like a phone interview instead. And in this interview, Chris talks about how one thing led to another when he was at Chris's house and they started kissing. And that's when they ended up having sex. And he says that he was only intimate with Krista that one time, mm -hmm. which is key as well, mm -hmm. that it wasn't like this yeah, ongoing relationship mm -hmm. and that he said he was extremely high off of the drugs and didn't know what was going on at the time. Uh, he said he was never even at the house on that Friday night and that after the party, he just went home and he says he has no recollection whatsoever of being at her house with Jeremy and that even though the prosecution says that Chris told them that uh, he and Jeremy were there with her. And that Jeremy was the one who killed her. Chris still claims that is not true and that he has never said that. Mm -hmm. And he says he has no recollection of ever telling the police that Jeremy stabbed her. So all these years, the defense is, you know, so all these years, Chris's legal team 
has been trying to work on ways to, you know, get him a new trial. And what's interesting is that they actually believe there's potential new evidence that could be found to hopefully lead to a retrial uh, for Chris's case. The defense believes that Jeremy actually had some sort of relationship with the police and that he received special treatment from them. And on the night of the murder, Jeremy actually got a call from the state police at 12.03 a.m., which is super random. Why the hell would the state police be calling Jeremy at that time if he was out partying with Chris that night? Like, that's just so weird that there is a number. And now, of course, the phone records for Jeremy have been destroyed, quote unquote. That's what they're Mm -hmm. saying when they're trying to get them. But he literally had calls from a state police number. Yeah. Yeah. And there's this whole conspiracy that there's some weird shit going on with that. Well, basically people think that he was actually like a informant for them for like drug stuff. Yeah. Like helping to bust dealers and stuff. In exchange for that, he got away with murder. Yeah. Which is hard to believe. (laughs) Doesn't really make any sense, but it is kind of weird. So that they never really figured. But Jeremy says like he was just calling his pager. That was his pager number. And that's the thing too, is we don't have confirmation a hundred percent that it was yeah. was it a police pager like whose number is it we have never been yeah. able to identify the exact sketch owner of this number but it is very sketchy that the area code matches up with the state police mm. and the defense has also since asked for jeremy to be subpoenaed in order to look at his cell records and figure out what cell towers his phone were connecting to on the day of the murder in order to figure out his location because i think that's key and i think jeremy is definitely a very Um, big person of interest for the defense for sure because he's he's definitely seems like he was there with Krista at some point whether it was by himself that night and he actually carried out the acts but again why would Jeremy want to do that you know why would what's the point like why is Mm -hmm. Jeremy other than if that story the prosecution told is true so it's like could he have been there at some point maybe I mean there was those fibers could have been from his uh, what he was wearing that night. It could have, but there's just not enough evidence. There's just not. And I mean, now the evidence, it's been so long. Unfortunately, they like yeah. destroy and, I mean, that the, stuff. The crime scene was a mess there. from the beginning. Like, there's just nothing, yeah. not enough to overturn it, which is yeah. crazy because he's in jail for life. Yeah, which is for crazy. something potentially he, he didn't do. And it sounds like he probably didn't do it. I, I don't know. I'm really leaning that way. Like I haven't seen at least there's a enough. There's a reason of a doubt that he did not do this yeah, murder. He did definitely. not murder her. I don't think he yeah. did rape either. I think it was. What if, okay, here's like an idea. Maybe it really was Tim. Maybe that's Tim I'm saying. was jealous. Maybe he saw the trash man out there for too long, knew the deal, knew she was hooking up with another guy or something. The next day goes and kills her because she was, you know, they maybe. Clear, whoever did it. I mean, clearly. there's plenty of that's, you know, I'm, that's just a random theory I'm throwing out there, but there's, plenty of possibilities that are not right chris Chris, i chris is on the list but he's far down the list it could literally have been her father's yeah mistress it could could have been susan Susan. it could have been i mean for all we know it could be someone completely random that's just off the radar and honestly we probably would know yeah we probably would know the answers if they had preserved the crime scene Mm -hmm. and there wasn't random dna all over the place yeah They've, you know, they've, it's, it is interesting to think about that, those drag marks outside, though, because I wonder, like, even well, if it wasn't Chris or Jeremy, like, could she have been getting in an altercation with someone else outside? Tim. Like, that's what I'm saying. Could maybe it could have, have been Tim. Maybe Tim confronted her in the, her driveway and she freaked on him and then he, yeah. he freaked on her. I don't think it was. A, I don't think a kitchen knife was. I don't think the knife in the kitchen was the one that they used. I think somebody yeah. had a knife on them. Maybe. And attacked her. And because because yeah. the other thing, too, is. She died because she was stabbed to death, which mm-hmm. stabbings are like, that is serious stuff like that. Yeah. You have to be up close on top of somebody to do yeah. it. So it's got to be like more common in very crimes personal, of passion, very mm-hmm. personal. And, and yeah, in crimes of passion, who's often, yeah. you know, the person behind it. It's yeah, I think usually they ruled a out him lover too, or something too soon. It seems like they ruled out everyone too soon. Yeah. And then just jumped on Chris immediately. It's like, yeah. Insane. Yeah. And, and well, whether it was racially motivated or not, I mean, it's just, it's yeah. so obvious that there was definitely some bias placed on Chris mm-hmm. because of who he was mm-hmm. and his circumstances. It kind of fit, he fit the mold they were trying to make mm-hmm. for their suspect. Yeah. And then they just went with it because they had nothing else. Yeah. Well, I mean, the DNA was there. So that's a big thing. Right. The the DNA, they had that, you know, and there was apparently they didn't find any DNA or identifiable DNA mm-hmm. 
I mean, there is a possibility it really was him and Jeremy was involved in some way or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many possibilities here. If only Ava could talk or, I mean, she can talk now, obviously, but if only at the time she could have like described it or something. I don't know the whole knife thing though. And why would, why would Jeremy and Chris just randomly go over there? And then just like after that night of having fun and partying, just decide yeah, to like, like a bit much like stab she, someone to death. That doesn't make yeah, any sense to mm. me. This, this clearly points to a passionate. It does look like that crime. Tim does seem like the most done. likely to me, but I don't know. Cause to step like literally they said she was stabbed. So the blade went all the way through her chest and Plus, hit like the his initial thing blow. was so, so was weird s- how he wanted mad. to bring this flashlight back. Like that didn't make any sense. And then the nine one one call was pretty weird. Like he was pretty shaky on it. And he was like, I'm pretty sure she's dead. And yeah, I think yeah, he, I think, he I think been involved. I'm in the boat of Tim. Yeah, Tim is it definitely, definitely raises me enough reasonable doubt for me to think he's Chris is too. in jail and he shouldn't be. And that's crazy. And Tim was smart enough to figure out how to cover it up and, and mm-hmm. say the right things. And, mm-hmm. you know, why the hell were you bringing a flashlight over randomly like that? Yeah. Who does Maybe that? he was like starting to get like super stressed about the fact that he knew Ava was there yeah. with her and like she had to be found. Like, yeah. oh, my God, she hasn't been found yet. No one's found her yet. I have to like make this happen. I'll just go over there and pretend to have walked in on her. Like I'll just, it almost seems a little staged, but I don't know. I mean, it's really hard. And why would Tim's dad say, did you do it? Yeah. That's really weird. I don't know anybody. Yeah. There's no way my parents would have been like, so did you do it? Like after knowing like one of your best friends died that they'd be like, did you kill your your friend? That's very concerning. Questionable. I, I think that there's a lot that Tim isn't saying. And I think that he probably knows more about what happened than, They've He's really like, said. I mean, ruled him out. It's crazy. And people get locked up for shit they didn't do all the time. All the time. And I feel like, honestly, Chris likely did not do it. And mm-hmm. that he's in jail for a crime he didn't commit, which is just insane. Mm-hmm. His whole life's been taken away because, I mean, at the very least, with the, with the way the justice system works, he should not have been convicted. Is he? And he's working towards murder. appealing that, though. They are trying. To- They're going to try. But like, again, he's. Mm-hmm. He's in a really tough spot. This yeah. Supreme Court of Massachusetts has already shot him down before. Yeah, so really hard. the chances are slim. So it's terrible. And There's then so Ava, I guess we got to yes. talk about Ava for a sec. So well, we already mentioned she was raised by Krista's friend and um, she got to see Tony and Susan somewhat and her half brothers and sisters, but she lived a pretty normal life, I guess. And she's a really beautiful girl from the pictures I've seen. It seems like she has a really active social life. She's pretty normal they said she just excels in every way and now she's in college so i mean she it seems like she turned out okay yeah considering yeah. what she went yeah, through. considering the trauma that yeah. she probably witnessed i'm, I'm sure. sure it's not easy for her no but, no yeah. but I'm, I'm glad to hear at least she's like moving mm-hmm. like living a normal life and yeah. happy hopefully and just mm-hmm. you know moving on leaving this in the past because this yeah it's a tragic it's story really sad very sad so we'll go ahead and wrap it up there today, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode of the Mile Higher podcast. Uh, we've got so many more interesting things coming your way. Mm-hmm. And uh, hopefully some more guests later this year. We love doing guests. Mm-hmm. Um, Thanks for being patient with us during the last month. It's been insane, but we are back on track, back on schedule. And we will be back with audio on Mondays and video on Wednesdays. Yep, yep. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube and iTunes and Spotify. But yeah, we'll go ahead and end it there. We'll see you guys next time. Stay safe. And stay woke.